Hello and welcome to Unsource Wall. My name is Elvis and as always I am your host. Okay so this is going to be kind of a packed week only because we are at the start, the cusp of SDCC Comic Con. Obviously I'm not going to be able to cover everything that comes out this weekend because this is recorded, edited, and then comes out at the end of the weekend. So you're going to have to wait until like next week for me to catch all the really really fun stuff. But hopefully I've got a little bit of the preview stuff out of the way in this one so let's move on into movie news first up we have the announcement that thor 4 is actually being made it's the first movie series in the mcu to go past the trilogy not even captain america or iron man got that so yeah while i'm more lukewarm than others on ragnarok itself it clearly did its job in revitalizing the brand all around i'm not that excited honestly But I still hope it brings the series to a well-deserved close for fans, especially given how divisive Endgame was to how Ragnarok was setting up its own finale to the series as it was a trilogy back then. For my own part, I'm only just glad that it gives the chance for Guardians Volume 3 to have less or maybe even zero amounts of Thor because really his interactions with the Guardians and Star-Lord in Endgame were simply awful. They were just so bad and honestly one of the most excruciating things about that movie. So fingers crossed all around. Next up we also have the first trailer to the third Kingsman movie. It's the prequel titled The King's Man, which I talked about before, and this trailer honestly took some surprising turns. All that we originally heard about this going in was that it was going to be set during the First World War, showing how the organization came about. And there's some elements of that here in the trailer on display, but the twist is is that apparently that section will either be a flashback or just a parallel storyline to what seems to be the recruitment and origin of Colin Firth's character during like the 60s or something. Which is fine and definitely clears up what Vaughn meant about how this ties into the final Kingsman movie, the fourth one, which is going to be set in the present again. This movie then becomes more like what if between the first two Men in Black movies, there was a prequel about how Kay fought Serlina for the first time. And I can dig it. And honestly, it looks like a ton of fun. These movies have been on incline with me. I didn't like the first one at all. I thought the second one was a riot, although really messy. And this seems like it could be the best of both. So fingers crossed, I can't wait to see more from this. Heading on into TV news, we have the unfortunate information that the SFX coordinator for a second season of Titans was killed during a tragic accident in the middle of a stunt rehearsal. Warren Appleby passed away after being struck by a piece of wayward equipment. Prayers and best wishes go out to his friends and family in this time of sadness and mourning. Some productions he worked on were the 2004 TV series Wonder Falls, which I thought was excellent, and the current IT movie series. Rest in peace, Warren. Now for some quick shots. Bruce Timm has said that a revival of Batman Beyond could be in the cards if the newly announced Blu-ray box set does well. And we also have that HBO has started teasing a new trailer to their Watchmen series sometime during Comic-Con. If it drops today, I'll try to edit in a reaction to it. Lastly, we have some quick shot comic news. The first is that there is a new Metal Men maxi series being headed by Dan DiDio sometime this fall with art by Shane Davis. It will tie into Dark Knight's metal and will be about the team dealing with a new nth metal based member. Honestly, I'm of two minds about it. I mean, Metal Men, yes. Shane Davis, eh. Dan DiDio, hell yes. Dark Metal spinoff, uh, who gives a shit? It could be really fun though, and I have some faith in Dan DiDio to really try and give it his all. He really likes Silver Age type shit like this, and honestly, I think he is a good pick for it. And it just gives me no fair amount of giggly joy that both the Dio and Giffen are having Master Series out at the same time. So, you know what? Good for them. Fingers crossed. I can't wait to see more from it. Hopefully it turns out for the best. We also have some Dark Universe based one shots telling the stories of some of the bad end worlds and their versions of famous DC events. It could be interesting, but honestly it seems like a very specific novelty for fans of that event. And honestly, I hope it goes well for them. I hope they get the fix they need because I'm really not at all intrigued by any of these. And lastly, Dendadio has said that he hopes to bring Mad Magazine back in full someday. And well, sooner better than later. Okay, so I'm actually not where I usually record because of, well, 100 degrees and I didn't bring my microphone. So it's going to be kind of quick and dirty here, but I'm just going to edit this in. We finally have the first official full Watchmen trailer to the TV show from HBO. And I just want to say that it looks really, really ridiculous. It looks like the second coming of Gotham. It looks so silly, campy, over the top, and just a huge ball of insanity, much like later seasons of Gotham, which, again, I really loved Gotham. I thought that the first season, of course, was 
a mess and was kind of half terrible, but it did evolve into annoyingly campy and outrageous show. And that seems to be where the Watchmen trailer sort of picks up from. It grabs that baton. And I have to say, it looks like a blast. I mean, there's every chance it could be just overly written, overwrought, melodramatic. But I want to err on the side of optimism for this one. I mean, I don't have that much hope in like Damon Lindelof or anything like that. But it kind of swayed me a bit. It looks like it's not going to be taking itself overly seriously, but it's trying to just be like this sort of freewheeling excursion into this superhero universe. So you know what? I'm interested. I'm all in because not only are we actually getting a lot of things right off the bat, but also that they're not taking their sweet time in dragging things out, but that they have a very definite idea of what they want to just play around with. So fingers crossed, my hopes are a little bit higher this time. And I just want to say that if it lets me down, that would be a shame because it clearly has a lot of potential. Other than that, the only thing that has been announced at SDCC that I think really warrants any kind of attention, or at least interested me at all, was the idea that, that Brandon Roof is going to be portraying Superman in the upcoming Crisis on Infinite Earths crossover for the Arrowverse. I'm not going to watch it. I'm really not. I just don't give a shit about the Arrowverse, but I think that it was interesting and actually kind of fun that they decided to go with Brandon Roof. I know he's played the Atom on Legends Tomorrow for the last couple of years. I think it's great because Brandon Roof and his fans have really been lobbying for some sort of reprise for him and well it's good to know it's nice that they were able to have this in their corner so fingers crossed for them anyway that's pretty much it for sdcc news fingers crossed for the rest of the weekend and uh, let's get back to the actual episode I recorded now we can move on to what i read this week first off we have the league of extraordinary gentlemen the tempest number six now, after 20 odd years, four miniseries, a trilogy of OGNs, and one OGN of extended background material, we finally have the conclusion to Alan Moore and Kevin O'Neill's century spanning saga. And honestly, what a sweet, fun, outrageous, if also somewhat tepidly expected and ordinary, at least for more, finale to this series. This whole final volume has just been overflowing with creativity, energy, and just exuberant leanings toward fun. Just being off the wall in terms of its plotting, its execution, and its presentation. Brimming with the attitude of two creators who aren't really taking anything about this seriously other than their own enjoyment and working together. And so this ending is nothing if not in keeping with that. Even up to the final pages and panels, some of which draw direct homages to Stan Lee and Jack Kirby's partnership, both milking it for the mythical team they made, but also casting some wry aspersions to their falling out. It's still more after all, but it's a surprisingly sentimental and comfy more at the heart of it. This ending doesn't break the bank in terms of imagination in any specific way, because this is like the third third or fourth time Moore has done this exact same ending, but the execution is a lot more freewheeling and oddly soft and easygoing for the characters and the franchise. It's not substantially satisfying and feels kind of rushed, honestly, but it closes up as much as it can and knows when to fold its cards, shrug, and walk things off with a smile. And what a wonderfully charming smile it is. Could it have hit harder? Yes, definitely, but it found solid footing and walked away with its head held high. Full of interesting bows to the story, a great amount of gags, and a sweet sense of closure to both this narrative and also to Alan Moore's career, if this retirement does end up sticking. Because not only does it pay homage to everything that inspired him, that came before him, but also his own career. In some really sweet ways, if you know exactly what in jokes he would be making. So maybe it's a bit too sweet, but it's appreciated all the same. And I'm going to miss Alan Moore. I love Providence. I love Supreme. I love Miracle Man. I love this. And he has so many other series, small and epic in scale that I think we would be lesser without as a comic community. So, I mean, happy retirement, Alan Moore. Hope you enjoy it. You really do deserve it, no matter what anyone else says. Two thumbs up. Next up, we have The Immortal Hulk number 21. This is an issue that again reaffirms how outright fantastic this run can be when it's shaping out to actually pull other aspects of what made the original Hulk run so engaging and fun together into a wider tapestry of Hulk. And I'm mainly hyping this up this much because this run does all of this by using one of my least favorite aspects of this actual series itself so far, Shadow Base and its leader. It just feels like such a corny thing to put in out of nowhere, and the fact that it debuted by butting in on some amazing solo Bruce adventure stuff only made it stick out that much more. I've been cool with it since, but I've never really warmed up to it, or the blank slate of its leader either. In fact, I've heard 
hardly been able to remember his name. He's just a huge ball of nothing until this issue, which is just a magnificent character piece for that character and for whatever the hell Shadow Base is. And yeah, that seems pretty apt, but it's been 20 issues, so I still say that my earlier disdain was justified. This issue makes the base's use, its leader's purpose, all the more clearer all the more exciting. And I'm not just talking about the last page either. I'm talking about how it's very much Ewing writing around other developments in the Marvel Universe to keep this Hulk run as mobile, as focused, and as centered as possible. Because this guy is General Ross. And he's not only just General Ross, he's Glenn Talbot too. He's everything those characters were, did, and represented. And it's what's been missing from this series. It really has. Sure, he's been an antagonist, but he didn't have that zealotry, that military staunch black and white bite until this issue when it becomes the whole forefront of everything. And it was phenomenal. I'm all in for this villain now. I can't wait for the rest of this arc, which promises to have this huge confrontation between them because it's now packed with some iconic flavor. The only thing I really don't con on with in this issue is that it has continued digressions of the Abomination. Someone on Twitter said that it would be hard for Abomination to go back to being a simple villain again, but honestly, I prefer it. The Abomination in this series might as well not even be the Abomination. He's kind of a nothing. He's just a plot device. And I think that he works in the narrative of the story itself, but as part of anything else that is more definitive or iconically Hulk, it's just really lacking. And it makes me kind of depressed that we might not be able to get an iconic Abomination portrayal in this series. And instead, it's just a whatever inclusion. And it makes sense given that Ewing said that it was Joe Bennett's idea to include Abomination to begin with. And well, that's neither here nor there. I'm glad that at least we have a villain, a solid, amazing, interesting villain to have now to work with here that does call back to a lot of the root core Hulk theme. So I'm really excited about that. Two thumbs up. Next up, we have Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen number one. This might as well be a quick shot because all I can say about it is that it's just good old fun. I had my reservations after the prologue of sorts in the event Leviathan special, which I felt was overly long and definitely overridden. It made me cautious about what the actual end product would be. And well, it was a huge sense of relief. Everything about this issue is just a whole lot more cleaner, tighter, wittier, and with a greater sense of comedic timing and pacing. Fraction and Lieber are on the ball in creating a light, breezy, fun exercise for this iconic character that doesn't feel self-conscious about his pop cultural status, but revels in it, and not even in a way that I think overplays its hand. It feels very confident, but not at all self-important. It reminds me a lot of Morrison's take on the character in All-Star Superman, where we just catch glimpses and shades of other vignettes and adventures, but here taking on a fuller and more standard life. It's the great effect, honestly. It's not the best humor comic I've read, but it's a great outing, and I can't wait for more of this each month. It's a sweet respite, and honestly, who can hate Jimmy Olsen? The way this is structured in simple, short chapters is honestly really, really fun, and the way that it presents itself visually, both in the fonts and the actual environments and gags and all these other things make it really special. If it keeps up this momentum throughout the 12 issues could be a definitive story or at least a definitive modern take to show where this character can be and where it can go without I think really kowtowing and really distilling and compromising what makes them special to begin with. One thumb up, one thumb middle. And lastly we have Spider-Man Life Story number 5. With this issue, I think I can safely say that by this point, this has turned to more of a generic standard miniseries. Not that that's a bad thing, far from it, but it kinda no longer feels like it's tracking a lifehood down, but rather focusing more on superheroics and very ordinary beats in this type of story. And I think some of the magic has you know, vanished. It's still entertaining, but it doesn't have the same style of very down-to-earth heart-wrenchingness that some of the previous entries had. There's of course the expected inclusion of 9-11, but it feels less impactful and just feels like another way to set up how bad things have gotten and Spider-Man's own hardiness. It sort of just feels there because it has to be. At the very least, it's respectful, but the cover itself speaks volumes more about the event than the issue does. It's an okay, enjoyable issue, but the series has lost a lot of its spark, and I wonder if a finale will be able to recapture that. I would hope so. In any case, it's been a fun ride, but one thumb middle, one thumb up. And now we can move on into what I watched this week. First off, we have Legion Episode 5, and this was just a fun episode all around. I didn't quite expect for it to go as hard as it does, but it really doesn't hold anything back. At all. It's probably one of the most incredibly heartbreaking and excitingly entertaining episodes yet. Which is saying something because I pretty much said the same thing about the previous episode. It's a different beast for sure, but it's a good signifier of how this season is just going all out. That previous episode was a somber, slow, methodical tragedy. This episode is inventive, energetic, creative, and bursting with imagination. So when it's breaking your spirit, it's at least doing it with flair. The 
basic gist of this episode is that due to David fucking around in time last week, time demons have been unleashed and are attacking the cast. Think the Langoliers meets King Crimson from JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. It's just awesome to behold because it just leads to a pack of engaging and amusing if also incredibly dark and depressing vignettes and set pieces of how the characters react and try to fight against the force that is just ripping them apart with a thousand different cuts before they even realize it. So you get some awesome ideas like some of the cast hiding in between the frames of the show itself, characters living an entire life within the same two feet, and others making duplicates in order to fill in the gaps of time that they're missing. All done with a great striking visual sense. And it's a blast. It's also, again, like really tragic and sad. And I want to just hammer that down because that is probably one of the most intense set pieces I've seen on this show. But overall, it's still a blast. It almost feels like a one and done episode for how it handles this threat. But so many characters get put through the ringer and forced to reevaluate and face their lives in light of this threat for that to count. It's a stellar episode. And I'm going to miss this show so much for episodes like this and for just having the temerity to even try this. So two thumbs up. Next up, we have Krypton Season 2, Episode 6, In Zod We Trust. And I'm just get this out of the way. This was the crash. It was able to maintain a streak of about two solid episodes, but that's about it. And I'm glad that I was at least expecting it this time, because that softened the blow. Because who boy, was this just an incredibly tedious episode. Now, it's not that it's trying to be, but it can't help but be at the mercy of a lot of factors. Namely, not pacing or parsing the season out in a sensible way. So we get some really huge developments in the previous two episodes, and then a lot of hand-wringing and running in circles in this one. Not that it doesn't have its merits, it kinda does, but even the attempts of some character building fall a bit flat because it's again stuff we've heard before or have come to expect and predict so it's just a lot of reiteration the acting this week is actually all around solid but the story is just another pit stop it does promise some amazing things next week but i wouldn't be able to actually tell you a single thing that happened in this one other than that nissa still has the hots for seg plus the way it deals with a major character death either means that they are 100 not really gone or that they just did it for the shock of it and they weren't really planning for it or preparing for it either way is on Honestly, just really dull. So two thumbs middle. Hopefully next week we'll get them back in action. And lastly, we have Swamp Thing, Episode 8, Long Walk Home. This was a slower episode as well, but it worked for pretty much the same reason last week's episode worked. Because it was just delightful to see these characters interact and flesh themselves and their part of the overarching story and conflict out some more. It's mainly set up, but it's well acted, well written, and well directed set up. So why even try and nitpick into that? Again, the obvious waypoint is Avery Sunderland. The man just hands it up to an extent that it overpowers everything else in the scene. Especially in the first chunk of the episode, where it seems like this might be a character character focus episode for him and that was worrisome as hell I'll tell you that even if the set pieces he gets alone are tragically consuming in theory he's just such a cheesy force thankfully he spends a breath of time alone with Alec and again Narek Mears is a powerhouse enough to hold the tide against Sunderland's cheese and bring a depth of emotion to the episode. Other characters like Abby and even the Cables get some more to do, and like I said, it's nothing really that brings the story forward. It's just them, well, deepening their characters and stakes a bit more. There's nothing really here that really drives the plot until maybe like the last seconds, but it's a welcome episode nonetheless. It's one of those episodes that makes you remember that this season was cut by three episodes, and that this episode would have slotted in perfect with that original episode count. It also leaves me pretty excited for the final episodes themselves, because if it sticks whatever landing that they could patch up with those two, then it might actually work as a solitary season after all. Nonetheless, great episode, great cast, great writing. I love this season, I love this series, and I had to give it two thumbs up. And now we can move on to listener questions. Our first question is from the amazing Yaki Cat on Twitter. And their question is, what names did I go through before I settled on Unsource Wall? And honestly, not that much. I mean, not that had any real contention or consideration. I went through a couple in my mind, like really quickly, like, what am I going to name this? Because I came to the resolution to make a podcast very quickly. I just needed that outlet because I had done it before with a few friends and I had so much fun with that. So I thought like, you know what? I should probably just do it for myself and, and just you know have fun with it so from that idea and having this come to fruition was probably about like two to three days i really just settled on a name like that like quickly because anything that i could think up had already been taken there's not a lot of things you can really go with 
for a comic podcast. Like all the obvious puns and references are pretty much taken. But meanwhile, I also have this blog I use on WordPress for some small reviews like movies and television and stuff that works for entertainment media, but not really for comics. That I called on Source Wall in reference, of course, to the Source Wall from Jack Kirby's New Gods comics. And like, why not just use that for the podcast? It's a good name, Unsource Wall. And that way, similarly to why I used it for the blog name, I can just do my own rambling on opinions and hammer home that this isn't really something that is meant to be like a definitive or even researched opinion. It's just my own visceral opinion. So yeah, that's why I settled on Unsourced Wall. And that's why I thought it was like, it'd be a cool name. One example I can give you of a name I did think up of was like Gutter Talk or something like that, but it just felt a little bit too esoteric. Anyway, thank you so much for that question, Akin Cat. I really appreciated it. I hope you enjoyed the answer. And our second question comes from the great Cezea on Twitter. And their question is, what are my SDCC predictions? And honestly, not a lot. I don't think there was anything I was really excited for this year. Other than, of course, Keith Giffen and Jeff Lemire's Inferior 5. I thought that if we were going to hear anything about that or anything about Jeff Johns's like waylaid imprint called the killing zone it would have been then but we already heard about inferior five living again anyway like a couple months ago so i just really nothing i care about at sdcc this year there really isn't i'm sorry if that's not the greatest answer but it's the truthful one i don't really think that there's anything i am truly expecting or that i'm really hoping for but it would be nice to be surprised i guess so hopefully we have some surprises in store. I really want to see or hear about something that is going to just blow my mind. So fingers crossed for that. And our last question comes from the esteemed Eggmath on Twitter. And their question is, what are the top five or so superhero comics that I think are essential reading for superhero fans? Not necessarily the ones I think are the best or my favorites, just iconic and influential stories that you think any superhero fan should try. Honestly, that's kind of a tricky question, mainly because there, well, there's a breadth of it. And some of these might not even qualify. I think the first thing that comes to mind is obviously the Golden Age Captain Marvel stuff, not only because it has such historical importance, but also I would definitely recommend trying out the original Monster Society of Evil storyline, not only because it is a great story, but also because it is one of the originators of the long-form storyline within comic books themselves. Like, it was, like, one of the first big story arcs in superhero comics as individual periodicals. It lasted, I think, years. So it's interesting to go back and read that and see how far we've come in terms of actually crafting arcs and events like that. And, well, just in general, I think that Captain Marvel's Golden Age stuff, it was one of the most inventive superhero comics of that time period. And it continued to be so because then you had that talent started working on Superman comics and then that entire aesthetic and style and sense of adventure and humor led to pretty much the iconic story of DC Silver Age so the second thing that comes to mind would have to be Alex Raymond's Flash Gordon run or really any of his Sunday strips or any Sunday strip honestly like Prince Valiant or anything like that mainly because that was where a lot of Golden Age creators and early Silver Age artists were getting their influence from and their inspiration from like infamously from Flash Gordon you had the Hawk people and Prince Bolton and their designs were pretty much straight lifted for Joe Kubert's iteration of Hawkman and like of course of Captain Marvel I think there are seeds you can see throughout superhero comics at a very formative age that I think is definitely worth checking out again this is like a pretty hard question because all these are just going to be like historically based but they're also still pretty good so I'm not quite sure how to parse that out and I definitely think that from that point it does get harder mainly because after you've gone from of course what golden age stuff directly influenced other ages of comic book history and the pulp stuff that it drew from I'm not quite sure if there's anything that is so important that has the same impact in superhero comics because other things in superhero comics that you then deem important are just things that change the tone or aesthetic and uh, I wouldn't really quite put them on the same pedestal as the works that directly set the cornerstones you know there's nothing really like of course check out pulp stuff like the shadow flash gordon and prince valiant even and the old tarzan strips you know jungle gym check out all of those because of course they're really important and you can see exactly where they have their descendants in how superhero comics developed and eventually will continue to draw inspiration from i guess that's it just two it's neither here nor there i really can't think of anything else I mean, I could rattle off just important big name comics, but I don't want to do that. I don't think anything else reaches that kind of historical or active importance like those two. And even then, those two have a bunch of subsections in them. Like I said, check out Prince Valiant. There's a lot in Prince Valiant that you keep seeing being made again and again. There's a lot in Flash Gordon that you keep seeing done. There's a lot in Golden Age Captain Marvel that you keep seeing done. 
because those are going to be the most important things you can check out and understanding superhero comics and why they work and why they're effective because they were there before these rules are even set down. They set down the rules and if you can enjoy them, you can enjoy superhero comics. Other than that, if you can enjoy them, they're not going to enjoy other things even if they are packaged differently or with more elegance because they're all drawing from the same basics that these set down. So sorry Eggman that that didn't answer your question in full but it would be kind of hypocritical for me to like say that anything else would be on the level of these two. So sorry about that. I really hope that you know this wasn't unsatisfactory to you. I really hope not because I'm just trying to be as truthful as I can. And that's it for this week. As always, I hope you had a great time. I hope you had a great time listening. I just want to say thank you to everyone out there who's ever sent in a question, comment, or topic. It means so much to me. It's awesome. And I always have fun with it. I'm so grateful for that. It's it's the most humbling thing ever. And if anyone out there has their own questions, comments, or topics they want to hear discussed on the show, you can always find me on Twitter at T-H-E underscore S-N-I-C-K-M-A-N. I also want to give a shout out to the cover artist for the show at D-O-T-E-M-C-E-E. Please check them out. Give them some follows. They really deserve it. They're amazing. Anyway, hope you had a great time. Hope you have a great Comic Con. Anyone who's out there, anyone who's following news, anyone who's hoping for something on their wish list to come true, hope it comes true for you and have a great week. See you again next time.